right, so I wanted to show you the previous iteration I had done, this time using an emulator, but as shown previously, it does also work on a real Dreamcast as well. So what we had was a very simple ball-like character. You could move, jump, items to collect, and very simple collision. There was also an editor, but everything was fixed in the file. You can only make changes temporary. As soon as you make the changes, exit, and it's there straight away. Also, I had uh, a very simple HUD showing health and points, and when you pause the screen, uh, you have um, just an outline of the controls. Note the Dreamcast special symbols, as all these characters come from the BIOS font. But unfortunately, the characters are very thin, except from the Dreamcast symbols. Um, so don't show very well on a real Dreamcast, uh, unless, unless you're using a VGA connection. But that's where we was, and I'll show you the next iteration, and you'll see the improvements. So let's now look at where I currently am. This is the new version. Once it starts. Okay, so you can see things are very, very different now, and it's more shaping into an actual game. For starters, instead of the board character, I have one of my own characters. I actually designed this sprite 14 years ago, and I've just made some slight changes to it. The animation is improving and so on, but it's a big step up from the previous iteration. So controls are very similar to before. You can also jump, but now the player floats, and you can do a slow float by default, or you can press deeper down to far, uh, fall faster. Because this is a scrolling level and the tiles are quite large, though that does exaggerate that the player is quite short, um, it's very hard to actually put together a level that makes sense. So this is kind of very much a prototype level and it's quite difficult to actually do any gameplay. But at least it allows tests now of the various uh, blocks and so on. The HUD is basically the same, but I'll just point out now, the text is rendered twice, once in the normal colour and again in black to create a shadow, so it's just slightly to the right and down a bit, so the text shows up a lot better now, but it's still not great and I will continue to improve the look of the text. Uh, when we pause, there's now a translucent overlay so that the tiles in the background, you know, don't show so well and the text stands out a lot better. I'll also change the colour, but again, we need to improve that later on as it's still a bit difficult to read uh, some of the text. You'll see that overlay some more later. So we've got various um, tiles, some of which have changed since last time. So for example, we've got this tile here, which you can probably guess what will happen enough time passes you fall through. We've got this lava block down here which kills a player instantly, which actually I should have landed on to show you. There we go. So see we've got an overlay again and you've got game over. Again this needs to be improved, it's just very simple at the moment. There's a lot that's gone into this iteration that you probably won't see, uh, but it's sort of at a playable point now. At the moment you can't retry the level, you just have to go into the editor but you can now create the level. So the level is saved to a memory card or VMU and can be loaded again. Um, so if you press C when in the editor, it creates the level. So to better illustrate, we go into the editor. Uh, let's change something round. Let's move this over here. Um, note that collision still needs to be sorted out uh, as it goes by the tip of the mouse pointer uh, and the tiles snap to certain points. Anyway, so if I now press C, it's appeared straight away. Also on, in the editor, we can press L, we reload the saved level, or we can press S to save. As I say, on a real Dreamcast, that will save to an actual uh, memory card if uh, present. We also, while we're still in the editor, we can turn the grid on and off, so that makes the placement a lot easier. So as you see, it snaps to a certain point, like so. So that's the uh, grid line. Uh, also on the editor, we can change any block, any tile to the player. So we can place the player as well. Uh, anything else? Uh, I think that's it for the editor, yeah. Uh, so just create that and so you can see straight away it has behaved exactly the same. So I 
need to improve the look of some of these tiles some are made a bit 3d like it doesn't really work well with the 2d but that can be sorted out later so i've got these spikes so obviously not surprising spikes take away player health and they make her react uh, if the spikes are like on a higher level uh, actually i can show this just stick them there create the level actually that's going to get in the way but the player gets stun stunned like that as well so the object of this level is i think you should be able to see actually if we just keep the player there and we just go over as i say this level is very simple it's hard to take advantage of all the game players as simple as it is but basically we have a door it comes out oh the door's locked so guess what you have to get the key very straightforward note that the door is actually in two parts so we've got all the items you can cycle through so you see the top and the bottom of the door okay because the idea is the player is very short um, so a door should be normal human size uh, so now we've got to go and get the key there's some spikes to avoid the player has very little health so make sure you don't fall on any spikes uh, the idea here is i need to find tunis but you need to collect the key before you you know the block breaks and you fall into lava and die but at the moment as long as you're quick you can just collect it okay and then speed that up over again at the moment the player can't attack or anything it's all about just surviving and now you go into there the game yay you've completed again very simple but a huge step up from uh, last time you won't believe how difficult as I'll explain later, doing the collision and so on. Even in 2D, it's such a pain. But anyway, let's um, just uh, take out the um, game, reset the emulator. Note it's in the UK mode. Uh, and we're going to the far. And you will see. Um, so this one over here is the old version before I had my own icon. And uh, this version is the current one. So you can see it's saved. Uh, I can assure you that is the correct date and time, more or less. And um, it got my, uh, you know, name of the game uh, and some information. I tried doing the same style as a typical Dreamcast game um, would do. So that would, as I say, save actually on a real Dreamcast as well. But it works fine in an emulator uh, too. So let's just look at how we are now, and I'll go into a bit more detail, not a huge amount of detail, but just looking at the art a bit more and collision as well. Now let's look at the graphics. Here we have the tiles. The first tile is transparent and just shows through the blue background tile. We have a solid tile here. We have the crumbling tile. And we have the lava tile. Next we have the items, some of which disappear once collected. And you can see the door which is in two pieces. Next onto the sprite sheet, as mentioned I designed these sprites something like 14 years ago. And I just updated the colours and made some other changes. So on the top row we have the idle animation. Note that the player does blink. It's a bit too regular but it's quite effective. Then we have the so-called walking animation which could do with a few more frames. Next we have the Mario-like jump frame. We have the falling slow frame and the falling fast frame. So this isn't really it's kind of an animation but it's just more individual states. They could do with their own uh, additional frames later on. We have the um, stunned frame here which I found quite difficult to design and the dead frame which is also a bit of a struggle for me. In the end I just did the player sort of slouched and looking downwards. So when designing a character we need to think about what we're trying to portray. So if we look at this character what do we see? Well the player is clearly not human. We see the ears we see the tail. Unfortunately I couldn't fit whiskers in. But yeah, you can see that the player isn't human. What else can we tell? Well, we can look at the player's outfit. You can see the player's wearing a dress. 
that's not very practical for adventuring but it shows that the player was sort of thrust into the um, adventure wearing her normal clothes but it also shows that and reminds us that she's royalty you also see that she's wearing gloves as well can't remember what this is around her neck it's almost like a scarf or something too long ago to remember but I just decided to use these sprites since I had them um, yeah, so we can see that the player is of royalty. She's wearing a very like peach-like outfit, um, and that she's just sort of ended up in the adventure wearing her normal clothes. It also helps for animation purposes since we don't need to animate her legs and her arm is always stationary. But we still show animation through uh, other ways, such as the bobbin bobbing up and down of her hair. Even this little bit of hair here moves up and down as well. So when designing characters, the point is just to think about what does your player do, what kind of outfit would be appropriate or not appropriate uh, for this type of game. What are you trying to get across uh, to the player uh, when they see the uh, character? Um, that is just a quick look at the uh, graphics. So it's very simple at the moment, but I can add more frames later down the line. Now I wanted to briefly talk about collision, but not for too long as it's, though it's important, it's quite boring. But if we go into the editor and turn the grid lines on. So for the very nature that we split up the level into tiles, that does actually help us with the collision detection. So if we pick up the player, you can see that any time that we're playing the game, we can just convert the player's position into a tile position. So if the player is in this position, for example, we can see, oh, there's no tile there, there's no problem with collision. However, it's not that straightforward. If you think about it, the player can actually overlap, in theory, four tiles at once and so at the very most we need to do four collision tests so say the player was falling okay you can see that in this situation we don't need to check for two tiles at the very most below the player so if the player is falling we look oh look there's a tile there a solid tile we need to stop the player from falling say the player is moving right we can see the player might be like head on to this tile here ok we stop the player from moving but she could also be there as well so there's a potential for two tiles one which is um, blank and one which isn't so that's how I improved the collision was to do multiple tests knowing at the very most we would have to check for four tiles however it does get a bit more complicated under certain situations uh, for example with a crumbling block well what if the player is slightly on the crumbling block and slightly on the solid one should we start the counter so that the crumbling block starts to fade away break up I mean or should we just leave it stationary if the block breaks should the player fall down so these are all sorts of things to consider so my reasoning was when the player is on the you know above the crumbling block enough, then we start the timer, and then when it disappears, then the player will fall. Similar thing with the lava down here. If the player was like one pixel on the lava, it'd be stupid to kill her, wouldn't it? So we'd wait for the um, player to at least get fully on the tile, as I call it. Uh, so completely on the tile and then we can kill the player so if the player lands slightly it would be absolutely fine then there was this situation we have here originally I had two crumbling blocks and we have two lava tiles overlapping each other so if the player is exactly over two lava tiles it's not going to do anything using the current collision test because it would be like, oh, the player is not fully on one lava tile, the player is not fully on another lava tile. So under this situation, I had to look to see if there was another lava tile to the right or left, and then adapt the collision testing. 
Uh, another tricky tile was the spikes um, because you can hit the spikes from either side you can hit them from underneath and you can hit them from the top so that caused a lot of issues a lot of back and forth deciding what to do so currently if the player hits the spikes on the side to get rebounded back hit from the top you bounce up and if you hit from the bottom uh, should it goes into the stunned mode um, well I don't think I actually I remember showing you um, in the previous clip was collecting the heart um, which is replaces the previous item um, the idea here was just to mention uh, that you would have to figure out that the blocks break after a while uh, and that would allow you to get the heart because the idea is that somebody could have like, made their way all the way over and they'd be like oh how do I get down there oh let's get this heart oh the block crumbles oh so that means I can go down here and then get to the key originally I had the key higher up but then you couldn't get back up again which caused big problems but that's just a brief mention of uh, how I how the collision detection is handled in 2D is quite tricky not as hard as in 3D but it's not too difficult to create really solid collision detection as long as you take into account things like the speed the player is moving and how many uh, tiles or whatever you're using you need to check against and how to check against and how to respond when the player does collide with something mm -hmm.